Welcome to week six of the Quick Start program. We're going to be talking about prospecting today. And I've got a lot of material to go through today, but I want to come all the way back to what we talked about at the very beginning of our training, which is the outline of the real estate transaction, the buyer side and the seller side. This is an overview of the real estate business broken into the sides. What we're going to be focusing on today is prospecting, but I want to talk a little bit about the seller side. Probably the most important part of working in real estate is finding business. Yes, you are part of the Century 21 family. It's the most recognized name in real estate with nearly 14,000 offices around the globe. It has the highest recognition of any real estate brand. But you're never going to make a great living waiting for the phone to ring. So our goal is to help you to achieve the success you desire. And to do that, we have to teach you how to find business and build that book of business. Prospecting is the first job of any successful realtor, finding people who want to buy and sell. It's also the number one reason that any real estate professional fails. It's a failure to prospect to go after business. And as a new real estate professional, you've got some choices to make. You can use a shotgun approach to prospecting by attacking every different property type and market, hoping to generate leads, or you can narrow your focus. A target audience might be for sale by owners or expired listings, or ongoing campaigns to a demographic group like doctors in the area or lawyers in the area, or perhaps a, a, an ongoing campaign to a neighborhood. But figure out where you're going to work best and focus on that target first and build that out. And then as you move forward, we'll add other things in. Second part of working with sellers is doing a presentation. Once you find someone who's planning to sell or buy, then you've got to do a great presentation, which we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. You'll need to make an effective presentation to the potential client, of course, but you'll also have to evaluate the marketability and potential sales price of that property. And further, you're going to have to handle objections that the owner is going to raise during your presentation and your analysis of the property. Keep in mind that every owner thinks their property is better than every other owner. So they always think it's worth more than it is. And finally, when working with property sellers, you have to make sure to deliver exceptional service. Exceptional service includes maintaining ongoing communication until the property is sold or leased, creating a specific targeted marketing plan for the property, and providing feedback from potential buyers of their property. That service component will also include negotiating a contract to your client's best interest. And that's where your future business is going to come from. Now, today we're going to concentrate on prospecting. When we start, and this is prospecting part one, we're going to have three parts to it. And we start by having a plan of what audience we're going to prospect. Define your target market. Who are you going to prospect? You're going to build your list of contacts and prospects and put them into your contact management software, whether you're using MoxieWorks or Business Builder. And you're going to maintain contact until they list or buy. And that means following up. Again, we have too many agents in our industry that are sitting around waiting for the phone to ring, don't we? Do you think you're going to make a great living staring at the phone, waiting for calls to come to you? You won't. And eventually, what do our spouses say to us? Yes, that's right. It's time for you to go out and get a real job. Prospecting, however, is not simply picking up the phone and calling possible buyers, sellers, and landlords. To be effective, prospecting needs to be a consistent plan process. Your goal is to create a steady flow of business into your pipeline that's going to create an above average income. In the long run, you're going to, again, deliver great service, and you will create raving fans and advocates of your business that will sell you to everybody else. It starts with setting time aside each and every week to perform the task of prospecting, because if you don't block out time, other stuff is going to get in the way. Well, Lauren, I just couldn't go prospecting today because I really needed to go shopping for groceries, and I had this out-of-town client, and I had this awful hangnail. If you plug it into your schedule and then book appointments around your time to prospect, you're far more likely to be successful. Prospecting is so critical early in a realtor's career, and I know I'm repeating myself, but in the long run, realtors who deliver exceptional service receive many referrals from their clients. Then you can shift your focus from finding new business to nurturing your existing relationships and providing significant value to those customers. Now, today we're going to start with the easiest and best group for prospecting, and that's your sphere of influence, your social network. Back in week two of Quick Start, 
we touched on the concept that you uh, likely know at least 100 people that you see from time to time. You've got family, friends, old acquaintances, former co-workers, college roommates, even that doctor, dentist, and hairdresser you see on a regular basis. And you may not realize it, but these people are the beginning of your client base. And as your career grows, uh, you'll add past clients, business associates, new contacts to this client base. And agents don't often realize that their 68-year-old Uncle Charlie could possibly assist them in the listing or sale of a luxury home or a multi-million dollar office building. The truth is that every person you know has their own internal database of people they connect with regularly. This group of people is their sphere of influence, their social network. Your goal is to hopefully convince your sphere to use you in every real estate transaction and also to leverage your relationships by tapping into their sphere of influence. And by the way, so when I said 100 people that you regularly know that you have gone to school with, you've had family, friends, remember, of 100 people, about 14 are going to sell in the next year. And about half of those people are going to sell and buy. That's 21 potential transactions. If your average commission is about $5,000, it can be a pretty significant income just with those people you know. Now let's think of the, all those 100 people may know at least 10 people you don't. That network expands out to 1,000. Now we're looking at closer to 210 people that are moving. And please avoid saying, I don't need to send anything to my family and friends. They all know what I do because they really have no idea what you do. The truth is that as much as your Aunt Petunia likes you, at this point in your career, she's probably not going to refer you to her old high school boyfriend who's now the president of the local bank. Why? Unfortunately, Aunt Petunia, like all of your relatives and friends, remembers you from your prior career. She can't visualize you as a successful real estate professional, and she doesn't want to hurt her present relationships by telling them about a new, unproven realtor. And by the way, it's not that Aunt Petunia and Uncle Charlie don't love you. They do. I checked. But they're afraid that if you, as a new realtor, make a mistake, it's going to come back to haunt them. One of our most successful techniques my firm has been to assist agents in appearing successful before they actually are. And we're going to go through that today. The technique involves keeping you in front of that social network, that sphere of influence, but also showing your sphere of influence and evidence of your production. Now, before I get into that, I want to mention something else. Of those 100 people that you know, you've got some nieces and nephews, you've got some second cousins, you've got some people you went to high school with. Do you actually know what all of them are doing right now? Do you know what their career is? And if they change careers, how long would it take you to figure out that they change careers? I cannot tell you how many direct relatives of our agents have listed someplace else because they didn't realize that their friend was now in real estate. So I want you to make sure to tap into this network as quickly as possible. And one of the problems we run into sometimes is, unfortunately, uh, when you get started, your family and friends remember every dumb thing you've ever done. And you need to find a way to get them to think of you as a real estate professional who can be trusted to handle their most valuable asset. And I mean every dumb thing you've ever done. And some of them are incredibly dumb things you might have done. So we're going to lay out a game plan. And we outlined this a few weeks ago. You're going to need to create a database of all those people you have come in contact with. Collect all the names, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses for everybody you know. And I also want you to get their mailing addresses. That's going to be important because I want you to physically mail stuff to them, and I'll explain why. Enter that information into your contact, your client relationship management program, your contact relationship management program, your CRM. And again, we're using MoxieWorks. You might also be using Business Builder. The key, again, is to get a database put together quickly so you can begin contacting that database consistently. But first is to get that list together. Then you're going to announce that you've entered the world of real estate. That's really your first step. And second, you're going to need to convince that sphere of influence, that social network, that you are the go-to person uh, for anybody needing assistance because they might know some other realtors. We recommend that during the first 90 days of the business, you contact your sphere of influence a minimum of six times, about once every two weeks. After your initial 90 days, you need to follow up with your sphere at least once a month, if not uh, more. Your initial letter should be physically printed and mailed, not emailed, because A, it's going to go into somebody's spam folder, and B, um, it doesn't carry as much weight unless it's mailed. Now, you can email them as well. 
Here's an example of what you might send. Dear Aunt Petunia, I can't believe all of you have an aunt named Petunia. As you may know, I've made a career change. I'm now a licensed real estate agent. I've affiliated with one of the top firms in Eastern Pennsylvania, Century 21 Kime. In order to obtain my license, I had to take several courses over the past few months and a state exam. To join Century 21 Kime, I had to complete a lot of additional education, but I think it's all been worth it. Real estate is an exciting business. I'm hoping you'll help support me in my new endeavor. If you hear of anyone thinking of buying or selling property, please call me. I'll include a few of my business cards with this letter. Please put them in your wallet or purse and give them out to anyone you can. Remember, although I may be new to the industry, I've had a lot of education and training, and I'm backed by some of the top people here at Century 21 Kime. Thank you very much. You should also immediately add everybody to an automated campaign or action plan in your contact management program, MoxieWorks. Now, you see on the screen, you've got available some e-newsletter letter campaigns and some holiday greeting campaigns. At least select one and add everybody in your list to that campaign. And we'll be doing a different video on how to add them, but make sure you add them in. Now, your second letter, you've sent out the first one. They're going to see it. They're going to say, oh, that's interesting. Sally is now in real estate. They're going to crumple up the letter and throw it in the garbage. Hopefully, they're going to hold on to your business cards. You might even put one of the business cards in with a magnet on it, so they put it on their refrigerator. Your second letter is going to show some evidence that you're actually working to sell properties. Now, honestly, by the second or third week in the industry, it's unlikely you're going to have any listings. You're going to need to borrow some. You're going to send out a flyer that displays two or three different properties for sale with your name and company name on the bottom of the flyer. You don't actually say anywhere that they are your listings, but your sphere of influence will assume they are, and their impression of you will hopefully shift. The reaction we're looking for is, wow, John seems to be doing well after only a few weeks. Ask around your office to find if anyone would mind if you sent copies of other agents' listings with your name uh, on them to your clients. It's rare that an agent's going to tell you that they don't want you exposing their property to 100 people in your database. At this point, you might ask again why you're physically mailing something when you already put these people on e-newsletters and holiday greetings. Unfortunately, much of what you send by email may never reach those intended recipients, and it's far too important that your social network knows you're in the industry to leave it to chance. Put this together, mail it. And at this point, and I know I'm talking a lot about mail, you should begin sending personal notes to everybody you know. Purchase a few boxes of blank note cards from your local supply store, then set up a time each morning to write five to 10 personal handwritten notes. If you send out five each day, you're going to hit 100 people in your database in just 20 work days. Your goal is to let them know you're thinking of them and personally ask them for assistance. In your manual, I have some suggested just notes you can send. One of the other surprising things I've discovered of top agents across the country is that almost all the top agents I've met follow a regimen of sitting down every morning between 7.30 and 9 and writing out between 5 and 20 personal handwritten notes. And personal notes really connect and resonate with people. If you plan to continue the practice after your initial wave of notes to your sphere of influence, you may want to really think hard each day of who you might want to run to or write to. But again, it keeps you in the forefront of people's minds, and it's different than what everybody else does. Next step. After two weeks, um, again, after two weeks sending your initial flyer with three properties for sale, try sending a similar one that has three sold properties. The headline uh, could read, successful sales by our team. Uh, and the tagline on the bottom of the flyer could say, if you know of anyone thinking of selling a home, land, or investment property, please have them contact me. And again, even though the, you are honestly telling people that your firm sold the homes on the flyer, your sphere of influence is going to naturally read this to say, you just sold three homes or four homes or six homes. And this is going to lead your family and friends talking about how you're doing such a great job in such a short period of time. Again, your entire goal is to convince them that you're the person to refer, and this will typically do it. Build on your initial letters with similar marketing pieces over the first year. Keep in constant contact with this group and add to the group continually as you meet new people. And during this time, make sure you connect with everybody you know on social media, whether you're using Instagram or Facebook or whatever system you're using. Connect with everybody you know. Try and bring them in and start sharing stuff on social media. And it doesn't have to be your listing. There are plenty of listings we have in the firm that you can share. 
uh, share a lakefront property in the Poconos or an oceanfront property at the shore that we may have on the market and one that's local. Make sure that anyone, anywhere uh, someone sees you, they associate your real estate career with you. It's important to do that. And you might be able to post some videos. This one's uh, one that Kathy Novak did on a property. You might share multiple pictures of a property. Or you might put up something like, uh, Dad, we have plenty of them we've created that you can share. Declare your independence from your landlord. I can help for people who are uh, renting. And over time, add to your sphere of influence list. First of all, you can add people into your Gmail contacts. That's what I'm showing on the screen over here. You add people in, just create contact, and then assign them a label like family, friends, uh, social, uh, family, friends, um, former coworkers, social network, realtors, whatever group you like. And as you add them here, it will automatically update MoxieWorks, or you can add them directly into MoxieWorks. So how do we add people? Anyone you know can be part of your sphere of influence list. That, again, includes your family, your friends, your old acquaintances, uh, people from your prior life, work, school, or life in general. And again, anyone you see on a regular basis, whether it's your doctor, your hairdresser, or that guy at the local pizza joint, they should all be on your list. And one way to grow that list over time is to ask permission to mail a few things to them. Tell them you'll be sending out valuable information. This will help them to visualize you as a real estate professional. Hey, Becky, you are the best hairdresser in the entire Lehigh Valley area in Canada. My hair looks great. Why, thanks. No, thank you. And by the way, I realize you see a lot of customers every week. You know, I'm in real estate, right? Yeah, I think you've mentioned it once or twice. Well, we've got a great program right now where we're sending out information on the market because it's going up right now or it's going down right now, whichever. And sometimes some items of value uh, we send to our best friends and our customers. Would you mind if I added you to my list? No, that's great. Should I use your address here at the salon or send it to you at home? And remember, in your manual, way back in week two, there's that whole three pages of memory joggers we listed for people in different professions. Glance through that list and try to think of anyone you might know or any past acquaintances that have these occupations, write them down, find their current mailing address, and then add them into your uh, CRM, your relationship management program. Next step, cold calling. So we've talked about sphere of influence in your social network. And by the way, even today, 64% of all sales done by realtors are done by somebody who already likes and trusts them or someone who's referred by someone who likes and trusts them. So in other words, you're doing business with your family, your friends, your old coworkers, and people they refer you, and your past clients and people they refer you. That's 64% of most business. Now, cold calling, I'm going to talk about second. I realize the absolute most avoided activity in the real estate industry is cold calling. However, if you don't have a large book of business currently, including lots of listings and a regular stream of buyers and investors knocking down your door, you're going to need, need to start building a career somewhere. And cold calling is one of the most effective methods of prospecting for several reasons. First, it's a direct method of contact. You're physically speaking with someone who may become a client. And second, it's an incredibly inexpensive method compared to the other methods. Mailing letters requires you to uh, pay the cost of printing, the cost of mailing, uh, stamps, and possibly even the cost of purchasing a mailing list. Mailing promotional products can cost even more. And third, cold calling is the fastest way to locate clients. It takes time to prepare a mailer, prepare a mailing list, uh, get a piece to the post office, and wait for delivery uh, before you have any hope of a response. Picking up the phone and calling people takes almost no time and can generate immediate leads. Years ago, uh, we used to try and talk everybody going into going into a training program called Sweat Hogs by Floyd Wickman. And Sweat Hogs was a program where over a 13-week period, they made you cold call three days a week for 13 weeks. And by the end, the agents were very, very successful. By the way, the average agent coming out of there that went through that program through us listed more than 12 properties in that 13-week uh, period. That's pretty incredible. And if you haven't listed 12 properties in the last four months or five months, imagine how great you'd feel having that much business coming in. So I'll tell you a quick story of Kathy. Kathy started the real estate business um, many years ago, I shouldn't say many years ago, Kathy started the real estate business a number of years ago, and she was almost deaf and had to use something in order to talk on the phone so that she could understand people and so they could understand her. 
And she got to a point, she wasn't doing as well as she wanted to. And she got to a point where she needed to either make that decision of leaving the business or doing what she needed to, to be successful. And we talked about it for a while and she decided to do the sweat hogs program to try and see if she could make it work. And so every week she sat down three times a week and only three times a week. And she called cold, cold until she got an appointment. So some days she got an appointment within 30 minutes. Some days it took as long as three, three and a half hours. It didn't take longer than that. Because again, more than one out of 10 people in the United States is thinking about selling their house right now. And as you call people, you're going to run across some that are thinking about selling, particularly if you call and say, hey, we just sold your neighbor's house down the street and they got a great price. We're looking for other properties to sell. Do you know of anybody thinking about selling? Some of those people in that neighborhood are going to wonder what their house is worth. Now, she called people three days a week until she got an appointment each day. That took her about nine hours a week of calling. Every time she did it, she got a listing appointment. So she did, went on three listing appointments a week. And by the way, if you went on three listing appointments a week for two or three months, how good do you think you'd suddenly get at listing appointments? Now, at least one of those three is always going to list, at least. So three times a week, she made calls for a total of about nine hours. She'd take about an hour and a half to two hours for each listing appointment. So this is about 15 hours of work a week. She'd have three listing appointments a week, list one a week. And at the end of the year, she had listed over 52 properties, more than one a week by the end of the year. And it was a poor market and 70% of them sold, which is still 35 or 36 sales. And by the way, if you have an average commission of about $5,000, multiply that by 35 or 36. It's a pretty good income, isn't it? She was able to do that just with cold calling and became one of our most successful realtors. So I'm starting at that point. Start by selecting a few markets and then think up a reason to call them, preferably offering something of value for them. For example, our firm may have recently sold a home in a quiet suburban neighborhood nearby. Ask the listing associate if he or she is going to call that neighborhood. They probably aren't. And she or he minds if you prospect that particular neighborhood for other homes to sell. Next, use a software program. We have available Red X as an example of one pro program. And make a list of all the homes within a certain radius of the sold properties and locate the owner's phone numbers. No, again, I did not say locate the owner's mailing addresses. I just told you under sphere of influence, we've got to mail something to them. But they already like and trust you. We want to call them and talk to them. Again, remember that most mails can be thrown out with ever, without it ever being opened. So in order to survive in this industry, you need to find business now. So pick up the phone and start calling the homeowners in the surrounding neighborhood. And keep in mind that you may be helping the property owner by giving them an update on what homes are selling for in the neighborhood. But Lauren, we can't do that anymore. Haven't you heard of the do not call list? Well, guess what? Our software automatically checks phone numbers against the do not call list. If you're using another tool to find phone numbers, you can cross-reference the list and don't call those people you're not permitted to call. Again, there are plenty of people who are not part of the do not call list. If too many people in the neighborhood are part of it, then you may have to resort to going out knocking on doors. By the way, that works too. It's been very, very effective over time. So let's talk about the elements of a cold call. There are four key elements to a cold call for real estate. And a fifth element if the call uh, recipient asks for information. One, identify the person you're calling. Two, identify yourself and your company. Don't lie to them. Three, give the reason or objective of your call. Four, ask a question or a qualifying statement. And then if they have any interest at all, close for an appointment. Any cold call should begin with identifying the person you're calling. And that accomplishes two tasks. First, it catches the person's attention. And second, it identifies that you're speaking with your intended potential customer. If, for example, you're calling a neighborhood out of uh, white pages or cross-indexing program in order to talk to neighbors about a home you sold down the street, You'll find your script will not work if the phone number now belongs to somebody who doesn't live in that neighborhood. And second, the second part of a cold call, you should identify yourself and your company. I realize there are telemarketing workshops that explain reasons for holding back information on yourself in order to prolong a call. I believe any relationship you needs to begin with honesty. So identify yourself. Third reason uh, for your call is to uh, give them that reason. A reason to call might be to let a person know that uh, your neighbor's house is sold 
or it might be as simple as a public service announcement like we're calling to remind you to change your batteries and your smoke detector. It's a pretty well-known uh, real estate agent who became a trainer who used a lot of these. Remember to set your clock back. Remember to change the batteries and your smoke alarm and all sorts of other calls like that and actually did very well with it. And the final required element is to ask a question or make a qualifying statement. Do you know of anyone in the neighborhood who might be considering selling? If you're making a public service announcement, you may want to complete the call with a simple tag about your company. And remember, Central 21 Kime for all your real estate needs. This is a very uh, ineffective close because it doesn't give the potential prospect the option to respond to you and doesn't give the potential uh, prospect or potential prospect any reason to prolong the conversation. Once you ask a question, though, stop talking until the receiver answers. If they come back with an affirmative response like, hey, I was thinking about selling my home, what do the Johnsons get for theirs? You now have a prospect. Try to set up an appointment to meet with that person to give them an idea of the value of their home in the current market. A simple direct script always works best. Hi, Mrs. Jones. Oh, good. This is uh, Simon Bonaparte calling from Century 21 Kime Realtors. I'm just calling because we recently sold your neighbor's home on Prospect Avenue. The home was a beautiful split level style. And we have had calls from other buyers interested in the area. I'm just calling to see if you might know of anyone else in the neighborhood that might be considering selling their home as well. If the homeowner you're speaking with asks how much the home sold for, it's a pretty good chance they may be considering selling their own home within the next year or so. Make sure to follow up with a personal note card and thank them for being so pleasant on the phone. Uh, hi, Mr. Smith. This is William Shakespeare calling from Central Home and Kime Realtors. I'm trying to find homes for my firm to market. I'm just wondering if you were considering selling that yours. Another direct script to try and talk with them on. And again, follow up with a personal note. You can also cold call for buyers. Prospecting for potential buyers can be done in a very similar, straightforward approach or with the announcement as a special program, um, like no money down or little money down. Potential buyers can be found in rental properties. One method of attacking this market is again to use an online index like Red X. Uh, check with your office to see what tools you have available. An approach might be, hi, Mr. DiCarlo. This is Muhammad Ali calling from Century 21 Big Dudes Real Estate. I'm calling because I'm looking for renters who are considering taking advantage of the current real estate market and becoming homeowners. We've got some incredible new low money down uh, mortgage programs, and we've got some great deals right now. Are you planning on buying a home this year? All things that might get them to start talking to you. Well, what low money down program do you have? What no money program do you have? Here's a little bit uh, more solidified approach. Calling them with exciting news. Hi, Mr. Arbor de Grast. <laughs> I don't even know how I pronounce that one, by the way. This is Clark Kent calling from the Daily Realtor. I'm calling to let you know about an exciting new mortgage program that can get you into a home with only $1,600 total cash out of pocket and a payment of less than you may be currently paying for rent. If you could own your home, own home instead of giving your landlord money every month and do it for less than you're paying right now, would you consider buying? Now, in order for this script to work, you're going to need to meet a few mortgage brokers or bankers and find out what the best low down, down payment programs are. There might be an Ameridream Dream program or a Hoop program or something that allows a buyer to get in with very little money. And you'll also need to find out what the average tenant is paying in the complex that you're calling and what type of home they can purchase for a similar or lower down payment. Now, one of the top agents our firm started cold calling right out of the starting gate. His first day in our Allentown office, he sat down, told me he had four kids to feed. He decided to prospect multifamily property owners in one particular zip code and call them. So he's going after investors, people who own multifamily properties. Hi, Mr. Oswald. My name is Rob Evans. I'm a real estate investor in the area. I'm actually also an investment specialist here at Century 21 Kime Realtors. I'm sorry to bother you, but I noticed that you own some property near mine. I was wondering if you're considering adding to your portfolio by buying more properties, or if you were considering liquidating, selling off some properties while the market's fairly hot. Now, this was a strong approach because many investors are either planning to add properties to their portfolios or sell off what they own. And using this script, Rob was able to find both property buyers and property sellers with one set of phone calls. And this cold calling technique really helped jumpstart his career. So what if you get voicemail or an answering machine? Yes, in today's society, many people screen their calls. I once heard uh, real estate super trainer Brian Buffini refer to the answering machine as the moat that protects the family's castle. Uh, voicemail and answering machines are gatekeepers that prevent someone from having to speak 
with anybody they don't want to talk to. However, a well-rehearsed answering machine message with a few details might entice a potential client to call you back. Remember that your goal in cold calling is actually to uh, directly interact with someone in order to determine if they're interested in buying or selling property. The method that's provided the highest percentage of callbacks for my team has been to leave a message that simply states, you want to talk to them in reference to either their home or your company. Don't waste your time asking on their machine whether or not they're planning to sell or buy. If they are, they're unlikely to call you back from the message. The first method is to simply let them know that you're calling about their home. You are going to be being completely honest, but they may hear the message to mean there's a problem or some situation they may need to handle. It's a, it's a method that's worked fairly effectively for us over the years. Hi, Mrs. Pratt. This is Dave Barry calling. I'm calling a reference to your home. Could you please give me a call back at your earliest convenience at 215-555-5555? The second method is to tell them you're calling in regard to your company. In this case, the responses have been have been greater if you don't mention that you are from the company. The assumption made by many hearing the message is that there's an issue with the company and they may be interested in finding out what the problem is. Hi, Mrs. Ivy. This is Greg McGuire calling. I'm calling a reference to Century 21 Kime Realtors and Stormbreakers. Please give me a call back at your earliest convenience, uh, if possible, at 484-555-5555. So again, leave some message if you can. And track your progress. So when you're cold calling, I suggest you take the time to create some sort of tally sheet to track your progress. You'll find over time that you'll become more creative and more successful in cold calling as you track which scripts work best in your market. So a tally sheet or tracking sheet would contain uh, the number of calls you made, number of messages you left on voicemail or answering machines, the number of people you actually spoke with, the number of people who made an appointment to meet with you, the number of people who called you back from voicemail messages. The creation of an elaborate tracking system is really not critical when you're beginning in cold calling. Too many agents get caught up in the details. The goal is to pick up the phone and find live prospects. However, tracking is really helpful in the long term in both improving your success ratio and in motivation when you can actually see that you've got some results coming from your efforts. Now let's move on. We've talked about social network. We've talked about cold calling. We're going to get into some fun stuff with expired listings. Expired listings are properties that have been on the market with a real estate broker for a period of time that failed to sell during their listing contract. These properties have been taken off the market by their owners or their listing contract with their realtor expired. And expired listings can be found in the local multiple listing system. Many of these properties are listed again with another real estate broker within days of being taken off the market. And most expired listings come back on the market within a year, unless seller's plans have changed or the seller finds they can't sell the property for enough to cover the move. Once a person or family decides to relocate, move up to a larger home or move down to a smaller one, or simply gets an uncontrollable urge or itch for new surroundings, they generally do move. Even if the owners take off a few months between realtors, they generally relist at some point. So calling or stopping by the home of an expired listing can be a quick method of building your personal listing inventory. Although the expired listing market can be a very lucrative source of business, it is one market where you will run into a lot of competition from other agencies and uh, other agents and other agencies. There are two important reminders when working the expired market. First, take the time to create a game plan of how you're going to approach expired listings. As you work the expired market, you'll be able to tweak your methods or approach and improve them. And second, as with any other form of prospecting, make sure you're going to, if you're going to target expired listings, do it consistently. Don't just take a hit or miss approach by calling through the expired listing once or even occasionally and expect it to work. Consistency is the key to any long-term success. So how do I find expired listings? On every multiple listing system we subscribe to, and we subscribe to a number of them, there you can search online for them, but there's generally some sort of market watch button. And by the way, when I'm recording this, we're in a very hot market, but we know it's going to turn, it's going to become slower at some point in the probably not too distant future. Despite that, this is the Lehigh Valley list. There are 237 expireds over the last three days just in the Lehigh Valley market in a hot market because houses expire when they're overpriced. They just do. Doesn't matter if you're in a good market or bad. If we're in a really poor market, you'll see a lot more expireds coming up. You can also, on any MLS system, run a search of properties that have the status expired 
with an expiration date of today or yesterday. Uh, you may choose to go back as far as a week. But if you go back too far, chances are they've already listed with someone else and you're wasting your time. You should contact the seller of an expired property the day that property expires. And the only deviation I have from this philosophy is to consider contacting old expired listings twice a year. First, just after the holiday season in January, some property sellers who chose not to relist during the prior year are beginning to consider testing the waters again. And the second time period is about two weeks before the market gets hot. In many parts of the country, the spring market is when buyers come out to look at homes. This also leads to many home sellers to place their homes back on the market that were off for a period of time. So if you contact older expired listings, you might hit them just the right time. Otherwise, call them the day they expire or use a process the day they expire. Let me start by talking about the seller's perspective. When you start looking at trying to list uh, properties that have expired, you've got to consider the owner. Consider their mindset or their frame of reference when you contact them. What's going through their mind is that they listed their home with a realtor six months ago. Their expectation was their home would sell too fast. By the way, most people believe that. It's going to sell too fast, uh, and they'd have to be out of the home too quickly, and they won't know where to go. After all, they've got the nicest home in the neighborhood. Everybody does. They chose a realtor with a good reputation or was from a reputable firm or somebody they knew, and they haven't heard from that realtor in the last four and a half months. These people are upset. They're depressed. They're mad at realtors because we're all salespeople after all. We should be ranked up there with used cars, not just the used car salespeople, but the actual used cars with rust on the bumpers. To complete the thought process, they don't understand why their home didn't sell when it was on the market. Obviously, the home was available on the multiple listing system. Why wouldn't you have sold it? You are potentially walking into a situation where they are very unhappy people who do not believe realtor, what realtors say because they haven't heard from their realtor in four and a half months. And they probably don't even realize that their house went off the market yet. They knew it was coming up at some point, but they haven't heard from their realtor in four and a half months. And they haven't checked the date on their contract, so they thought it was still on the market. And suddenly out of the blue, this unhappy couple received somewhere between 30 and 100 phone calls that day. That's not an exaggeration. I'm not kidding. Half of these callers will say the exact same thing because they've all been trained by Mike Ferry or Floyd Wickman, and they use a script. Incidentally, I'm not criticizing you the, either of these two exceptional trainers. I highly recommend going to see both of them. But they've been so successful that their words are so ingrained in every company in the country. So they hear the same scripts over and over again. And then the day after the home expires, they'll get 50 or more letters from realtors all over the region. Again, I am not exaggerating. And most of those letters will say exactly the same thing because half of them will be from the Craig Proctor system and the other half will be uh, simply printing a letter out of a software program like Top Producer. A dozen of the letters will be from agents claiming to be the very top selling agent in the entire area. And remember, homeowners are just kind of getting out of a relationship with a realtor that they believe lied to them. And many of these letters will even contain bar graphs showing how their company outsells everyone in the entire Eastern Hemisphere. So how does the owner know what's true and what's not true? It's easier to believe that we are all full of crap. Our team at Century 21 Kime is composed of a number of highly trained and skilled brokers and agents. Because we have a successful group, several years ago, we found that many agents were continually bumping into each other with the same approaches to expired listings, and they were getting frustrated. So we spent a considerable amount of time putting together a series of different approaches to expired listings in order to attract different property sellers. And in the manual, I outline a number of different approaches, and I'm gonna talk through some of them today. Different individuals gravitate toward different messages. Some homeowners will call back on a carefully written note, a handwritten note. Others will want a complete package of information before they call. Still others will be attracted by something humorous or attention getting. We tried a variety of approaches to test their effectiveness. And each of these methods involves mailing or delivering something to the homeowner. I need to be blunt here and explain that the best approach to prospecting is always direct contact. In other words, stopping by the home and introducing yourself in person is by far the most effective method of capturing expired listings. Unfortunately, most of you will never do that. The second most effective is to have a phone conversation with the owner. And because I realize that most realtors will never, ever, ever actually stop by a home unannounced, I'm including some of these methods in as alternatives to the direct approach. Now, there are two keys to getting the attention of the owner of an expired listing. The first is to remember that you must stand out above the crowd. 
of, of all the other agents who sent similar letters. It's all in the approach. You must think outside the box and do something completely different than everybody else. The second key is to look at the seller's needs from their perspective, not yours. Anytime you're attacking any market, whether the market is bank foreclosure departments, uh, relocation departments and major corporations, estate attorneys, or in this case, expired listings, you need to figure out what you can do to help them. What benefit do they need? For expired listings, I've got two suggestions for thinking from the homeowner's perspective. First, the homeowner is unhappy with realtors. They don't want to be tied into another six-month contract. They don't want to get stuck with another bad experience with the house not selling because they refused to believe that the house didn't sell because it was priced too high. It was. That's probably why it expired. But they don't want to believe that. They want to believe that the uh, house didn't sell because of the realtor's ineptitude and poor marketing skills. They're also mad at the prior realtor for not calling them back. Now, you can positively impact these sellers with a listing cancellation guarantee that allows the sellers to cancel your listing contract if they're unhappy with their service. And the other way you could possibly impact this group is by specializing their situation. You can send out a letter explaining that you're the neighborhood expert or the split level expert or the lakefront expert or the oceanfront expert or the historic homes expert or the expert in handling market challenge properties that didn't sell during their initial listing period. That's another way you can positively impact them. Your goal is to get an appointment, not sell the owner and yourself or your company if you do call them. So when you're calling them over the phone, unless the owner's out of state, it's nearly impossible to get them to list their property with a phone call. You need to identify yourself, confirm that the property is no longer for sale, and figure out a way to get the seller to meet you, to get to meet you in person. So with the cold calling, my approach has always been almost apologetic. Hi, Mr. Kerrigan. I am really sorry to bother you at home. I noticed that your home went off the market today, and I realize you probably had a dozen other calls already today, but I service the area, and I was just wondering, were you still planning to sell the home? There are several ways a homeowner can react to this statement, and you may need to be prepared for any of them. Some will tell you, uh, my phone has not stopped ringing. I wish you bloodsuckers would leave me alone. Uh, go chase the ambulance. Others will be surprised. What? My home went off the market? No, it didn't. Whatever the reaction is, you need to keep them on the phone, build rapport with them, sympathize with their situation, and look for a reason to meet them. A strong technique to accomplish this is to end each comment that you make with a question. Hi, Mr. West. I'm really sorry to bother you at home. I noticed that your home went off the market today. I realize you've probably had a dozen other calls already, but I service the area, and I was just wondering, were you still planning to sell the home? My home went off the market? No, it didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you didn't know. When you list with a realtor, the listing contract has a specific length of time. Your contract was apparently up and your home went off the MLS today. Didn't your agent tell you it was coming up to expire? Uh, no, they didn't. Wow, Mr. West, I'm really sorry about that. Hey, are you still planning to move? Now, when I'm saying this, by the way, I'm not just answering, I'm going right back into a question. Are you still planning to move? Uh, you can call me Wally and I'm not sure what I want to do right now. If I, I may ask, where were you planning to move to? West coast of Florida, I'd like to retire and move somewhere warmer. Oh, I love Florida. I've helped a lot of clients over the years move south. I'm just looking over your listing on the MLS and I'm really surprised that the home didn't sell during the listing period. Would you mind, I, I don't wanna impose, but would you mind if I stopped by and took a look at the home? Well, we're not, we're not gonna hire another realtor. We're not ready to do that. Well, that's no problem. Really, all I'd like to do is get an idea of what happened. I, I can go over the market with you and give my opinion of your home. I can try and figure out what went wrong and why it didn't sell. Then if you ever do decide to put the property back on the market again, you'll have another opinion. Would you be free for me to stop by an evening this week or would uh, daytime be better for you? Another dialogue is uh, Mrs. Beldehoppen. Really sorry to bother you at home. I noticed that your home went off the market today. I realized that you're probably at a dozen other calls already, but I service the area and I was just wondering, are, were you still planning to sell the home? My phone has not stopped ringing. I really don't wish to talk to any more realtors goodbye. I, I understand. I would probably feel the same way. I mean, you put your home on the market expecting to sell quickly. I looked at the listing. It looks beautiful. And something went wrong. And now you're probably being hounded by every other air, realtor in the area. Do you? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Do you have any idea why the home didn't sell? No. And I'm very busy. I understand. I don't want to take much of your time, but... You're in my market area, and I've been looking at your listing information. Like I said, it really looks like a beautiful home. Did, did your agent even advertise the property? 
I have no idea. I haven't heard from my agent in months. Wow, that's awful. Didn't they at least do it like open houses or something just in the very beginning? Where were you planning on moving to? Well, I'm planning on staying in the same school district. We've just outgrown the house. We need more space. Well, you certainly are in a very good school district. I've helped a lot of clients in the district over the past several years. Again, I'm, I'm really surprised your home didn't sell during that initial listing period. Would you mind? I, I mean, I don't want to impose, but would you mind if I stopped by and took a look at the home? I'm really a very busy person. Now, that's no problem. I just want to take a quick look. I may even be able to figure out what went wrong or why it didn't sell. Then if you ever do decide to put the property back on the market again, you'll have another opinion. Would you be free if I stopped by an evening this week or would during the day be better? And that, by the way, is called an alternative choice. You don't say, can I stop by? Yes or no, because the answer is always no. An alternative choice is, are you free in the evening or would daytime be better? Are you free tonight or tomorrow night or would the weekend be better? Those are alternates of choice. How about a third dialogue? Mrs. Lederhosen, I am really very sorry to bother you at home. I, I noticed that your house went off the market today. I realize you've probably had a dozen other calls already, but I service the area and I was just wondering, were you still planning on selling the home? Yes, but I'm going to be much more careful when I hire an agent this time. I planned to interview three or four different agents because I had a very bad experience with my last agent. Oh, I completely understand. If I were you, I'd do exactly the same thing. Never hurts to get several opinions on the price of a property and to hear different methods of marketing homes. If you're going to interview several agents, I'd really love to be one of those you interview. Would that be possible? Well, it depends. What's your commission rate? Well, I do negotiate my commission. That's negotiable. And we can certainly discuss it and I'm open to your thoughts. But when were you planning on conducting inter interviews? Early next week. Well, that would work fine for me. If possible, would you consider inter interviewing me first? Why? Well, I work a little differently than most agents. My goals are to build long-term relationships with each of my clients. I do that by going above and beyond the norm when I'm marketing a home and delivering service. I always tell owners who are considering selling a property that they should select an agent based on the strength of their marketing and their service. If you interview me first, you can measure other agents' marketing plans against mine. Would an evening work better for you or during the day? Yeah, these are dialogues to try and get your thinking about what you can put down and how you can answer questions. Now, we've talked about stopping by. We've talked about making phone calls. Let's talk about other methods. As I explained earlier, there are two primary messages that owners of expired listings tend to respond to. First, they don't want to be tied down with another agent who doesn't provide them service. So you need to convince them that you'll provide that service. And one way to show sellers that you, what you, that you mean what you say about service is to put the, an offer to the seller in writing, to something that holds you accountable, put the control back in their hands. You can provide the seller with a listing cancellation guarantee. We've also called it a fire me guarantee, or on the screen, you'll see easy exit guarantee, where you guarantee if the seller is unhappy with your service, you can cancel a listing. Now, this is a hard pill for most agents to swallow because they believe every listing will cancel. And the truth is a few of them will. But the further truth is you will list far more homes because you offer proof of your service and then you will lose. And the second message that an expired listing will respond to is that you specifically work in their market, know their type of property or are a specialist for their type of property. Everybody loves a specialist who really understands their particular needs. Remember, the homeowner still believes that the price wasn't the issue. The main problem in their mind was that the prior realtor didn't know how to market the property. So they're looking for someone who can show a different way to market. The approach I use is to stand out from the vast majority of realtors was to mail a large package rather than a number 10 envelope with a letter. The package costs a lot more to put together and a lot more to mail than a simple letter. But I got a much better response from a package than I did from any letter I ever sent. The package was a nine by 12 envelope stuffed with information. And inside included a letter highlighting why my team and I were different than most real estate ex, uh, agents, an explanation of our guarantees, including a release of listing if they're unhappy with our service, and a guarantee of feedback and weekly calls, and a brief description of our marketing. The rest of the package was filled with samples. We created a nice uh, listing um, cancellation guarantee we called the easy exit policy that allowed the homeowner to see our guarantee more than once. We also included a page dedicated to our guarantees, a photo page of our team and their job descriptions, a sample of our full color home flyers, and a 12 page booklet we wrote on why some homes just don't sell. These clients are starved for information. 
How could it be that their home didn't sell when the ugly one down the street with the pale green shutter sold in only seven days? It must be that no one knew their home was for sale. So our booklet explains the three primary reasons home doesn't sell, marketing, staging, and pricing. It also gives the homeowner who reads the booklet the opportunity to call us with no obligation for an analysis to figure out which of those reasons may have impacted the home sale when it was marketed the first time. And you can even create several different packages that are targeted at specific property types. One package could be created for condos and townhouses with a sample flyer of each. One package might be created for luxury properties, one for average homes, one for historic homes, one for farmland, and so on, anything you can think of. But create the package. That was one of the campaigns we used. Second one, not wanting to duplicate my efforts, other agents in our company attempted completely different approaches that would stand out from the crowd. One method was developed by Tim Mahan and Wayne Talibur. They felt that if they could be the very first people to talk to the owner about their situation before the seller received those 50 phone calls and 37 letters, they'd be far more likely to get the listing. The problem was that to be first, the agent would probably have to call the seller of an expired listing or stop by their home at 6 a.m. to beat all the other agents to the punch. Neither agent believed they'd be getting a great reception for the potential listing at six o'clock in the morning. Although I do know of agents who have tried that, picking up the phone and calling somebody's home at six or 6.30. Now they came up with an alternative plan. Most families are dual income and most home sellers leave for work in the morning and wouldn't even know that a realtor had called until they returned home that evening and played back their full answering machine or voicemail. Further, when one of our agents was the first realtor to speak with an expired listing, they often found the homeowner had no idea that the home was going off the market that particular day. Again, they hadn't spoken with their agent in a long period of time, so they weren't aware of the expiration date coming up. Wayne was already an early bird, so he decided he would go to the office before five in the morning. You have to be prepared to do this. Pull off a copy of the daily expired list. This method, by the way, is not for the night owl or those of you who have trouble getting out of bed before 10 or the crack of noon. So in order to get a client before everyone else in the real estate industry, between 5 and 6 a.m., Wayne and Tim would go to the homes of expired listings and hang a plastic bag like this, the kind that newspapers come in, with information on their front door. Again, these plastic bags are the same ones they use for newspapers. Since the bags are hung on the front door knob, the owner would hopefully see the bag when he or she came out for work in the morning and pull it in. And inside, Wayne and Tim had a package of information about their services. But most importantly, the clear plastic bag allowed them to face the headline of their message out. So anyone picking up the, the bag could easily read the note. And I always believe that 90% of the message is in the headline. If you don't believe that, check out the presidential elections. Their headline read, do you know your home is no longer on the market for sale? And that headline took up a third of the paper. So it was clearly readable through the plastic bag. The homeowner would bring the bag into the house in the morning or take the bag with them to work. They'd see the headline and open the package because it surprised them. And a brief letter under the note explained that homes are placed in the market in the MLS for a period of time. That period of time had expired with their current realtor. And that means their home's no longer on the multi-list and was going off Zillow and Realtor.com. In over 100 cases, the homeowner would pick up the phone and call Wayne or Tim from work and ask about the letter. These agents then become the first contact with the expired homeowner, making them far more likely to get an appointment. Tim, I found your note on my door this morning. It says that my home's not on the market for sale anymore. I don't understand. What do you mean it expired? Again, owners don't necessarily know our lingo. Tim or Wayne would explain to the property owner that his or her contract ended with the realtor. An easy question for our agents were, were you happy with the service your current realtor gave you? And the answer almost always is no. The owner didn't even realize the home had expired and probably hadn't heard from their agent in four and a half months because there was less hostility from the owner than if Tim or Wayne had been the 27th phone call to the owner. They could also ask, are you still planning on selling? Or are you planning on staying? Because they weren't competing with those 50 calls that would come later on in the day. And this is an example of what they might have in that uh, initial note that went out. Another agent with our firm, Rob, had a little bit of a different approach to the same problem. Ultimately, what the homeowner wants is to get the property sold. What we as realtors want is to get an appointment to meet with the homeowner in order to show them our marketing and servicing plan is better than the competition and why our, better, our plan is much better than what they previously had. Now, Rob's method was based on the idea that many sellers are grasping at anyone who might be interested in purchasing their home now 
rather than waiting for their full marketing cycle with another realtor. I'm not suggesting what Rob did was right or wrong, just that it was very effective in getting in the uh, getting home sellers to call him rather than the other way around. So Rob purchased plain white four by six postcards, just postcards, blank postcards. He used a uh, larger than typical postcard in order to stand out in the mail. Then he took a felt tip pen and hand wrote, dear blank, there's nothing here. I'm wondering if you would consider selling your home to one of my buyers. Please call me, Rob. Then he'd go to Kinko's or FedEx or a local print shop and have a thousand of these cards printed. And each day, Rob would pull the expired list and complete each card. And he'd fill in John's name there and put John's address on the back. John Smith, 123 Main Street, Mertztown, Pennsylvania, might go on the back. People would make the assumption that Rob had a buyer interested in their house. And they would call just him. Again, I'm not suggesting this was a good approach or a bad approach, but it worked very effectively for Rob. There are two ways to look at the real estate industry. One way is that we are all here to make a living. And if we can do that without being illegal or unethical, then a little misleading or misdirection is not terrible if the end result is that the seller sells his or her home and the agent gets paid for their hard work. The second way, because some of you are going to take offense to this particular approach, to look at the real estate industry, which is typically my thought process, is that we're here to provide a great service to the community. That's the way I think. Understand that I'd like to be paid for my service, my experience, my expertise, and my negotiating ability, but I'm still providing valuable service. I don't want people sitting around at a party telling their friends how I misled them. I'd rather not have that piece of business if that's the way I would have to work, although I respect methods that attain results, and this will work very effectively. I was in a training course some years ago listening to super trainer Floyd Wickman explain that he certainly did use techniques. Objection handling tactics and salesmanship were all used to get buyers and sellers to work with him, but his clients loved him for it. His end result was that he delivered more than his competitors did for his clients. And in some cases, he never he had to use some techniques to get in the door in the first place. <clears throat> One of my favorite lines for Floyd Wickman is, I never got a Christmas card from a prospect, only those that I techniqued. So keep that in the back of your mind. So anyway, owners of these expired listings would receive their card. And they'd call Rob. Uh, Do you have a buyer for my home? And Rob's response was fairly simple. I don't know. I haven't seen your home yet. But I'm working with a lot of buyers and I'm hoping hoping one of them will like your house. I saw it went off the market. It looked like a beautiful home. I can't believe it expired. And I have a lot of buyers looking in the area that I'm working with. Well, why didn't you sell what was on the market? Well, you know, at Century 21 Kime, we try to sell our own listings first. That's what our home sellers hire us to do. And that's what's fair to our sellers. Anyway, I wouldn't mind stopping out and at least taking a walk through your house. That way I can tell whether or not it's going to work for one of my buyers. Once you manage to get in the door and meet with the homeowner in person, you can use a surprised approach. Wow, this is a really nice home. I'm surprised it didn't sell. And remember, to be honest, uh, don't say things, don't say how nice a home is if there's really no redeeming qualities about it. And then build rapport and begin a conversation with the goal to lead into talking about marketing the home and what your firm might do that's a little different than other companies. And this approach was very effective. Incidentally, our firm dominated the expired listing market for a long period of time. Each of these approaches outlined um, that I'm outlining is just as effective as others. We seldom overlapped with listing appointments, even though we all went after the same customers because some owners responded to morning delivery. Others responded to a personal handwritten note and others found the package to be more interesting. Fourth campaign, the hay box. In Pennsylvania, it's relatively easy to find hay. We would fill a small box with hay. By the way, I have a bunch of these sitting around the office at the moment. You can fill these with hay. You can buy cake boxes at the moment, at least for about a quarter or 30 cents a piece. We'd buy a package of those large plastic needles to sell Walmart, Target, and other fine retailers. We would punch a hole in our team business card, tie a needle to the card with a piece of yarn. We would bury the needle in the, yeah, you guessed it, hay, and place the card on top. And last, we would close and seal the box writing across the top. Finding a great real estate team is like finding a needle in a haystack. Remember, creativity sells like nothing else. Our goal is to stand out from the crowd. Most recently, agents Bonnie Smith and Marlene Moser from our firm used this technique to begin building a strong listing inventory. They would go out in the morning and leave these boxes on the doorsteps of expired listings, or in some cases for sale by owners. Putting these boxes together takes a lot of time, patience, and a little bit of money. 
But the boxes catch a lot of attention and prove unequivocally that the team leaving the box approaches marketing differently than any other realtor that uh, the sellers might meet. So we have a note in the box as well, explaining that in order to sell a property in this market, you're competing, we're competing as realtors against 2,000 or 2,800 other realtors. When you're selling your house, you're competing against 4,000 other homes in the market. And in order to be to stand out, you have to have marketing that stands out. I show you how we um, stand out as a team. We can do the same thing for your house, stuff like that. We've utilized other unique approaches that have worked well also. Our crumpled letter campaign involved visually showing property owners that we understand marketing and how to make ourselves stand out, which means we'll be more likely to market their home uh, make their, or to make their home stand out. We would print across the top of the letter, again, taking up the top third. For your convenience, we have pre-crumpled this letter. Remember that the headline is critically important in any marketing piece you send to potential clients. The headline is what entices the prospect to actually read your message. In the letter itself, we would include language explaining why our service and marketing is a little different than the typical agent in the marketplace. And the next step is to take that letter in your hands, crumple it into a ball, and once it's crumpled, flatten it out again and fold it so the headline's immediately visible when the prospect opens the envelope. We found that uh, expired property owners and for sale by owners are more likely to open that letter because it feels different than most of the letters they receive. And we've handwritten their name and address on the outside. Handwritten letters, by the way, are far more likely to be open than printed addresses. And also letters with stamps on them instead of postage meter stamping are also more likely to be opened. And that's what it looks like when it's all crumpled up. So here's an example of it. This listing agreement with your current realtor has expired and your home was taken off the market by, on the multiple listing system today. By the time you read this letter, I'm certain you've heard from dozens of real estate agents claiming to be the best in the marketplace, making all sorts of promises in order to get you to list with them. I believe I'm a bit different than other realtors in the area. What you need to sell, what you need to sell your property is someone who understands how to market or someone who understands how to make herself or her homes for sale stand out from the competition. And I'm the person to do that for you. In addition to my marketing expertise, I offer a guarantee that if you're unhappy with my service at any time, you can fire me. You can cancel a listing with no questions asked. I call this my listing cancellation guarantee. What I would like is to have the opportunity to spend a few moments with you and find out what your plans needs are. Then I can determine if and how I can help you. Is that a little different than most of what they might be receiving saying, I'm number one, I'm number one? Other things you can do, you can put together a series of postcards. Again, postcards, they're going to get a bunch of them. But what if they get four or five or seven of them over a 30-day period of time? If they do, that period of time, they're going to see this uh, series of postcards come in, and it's going to show them that you're a little different and remind them that you're standing out. And some of these are pretty good. Puzzled over why your home hasn't sold yet? Looking for the perfect place? Uh, to, uh, it's a different one than I'd like. Home hasn't sold yet? Don't panic. Call me. These are all work, the things that work well. One more I'm going to do. Uh, you can buy postcard paper where you can print uh, postcards on it. And using Canva or any other software program, you can take a photo of their house. You might be able to steal it off the multi list or take Google's photo, uh, put it onto uh, uh, Canva, and then add your contact information on top of it and then send them a postcard. And on the other side of the postcard or inside it, it talks about how um, we're more aggressive in marketing. And again, they'll be surprised to see their own home on the front of it and they'll read your message and it's their way to get in front of them. Now, the last thing I'm gonna talk about today is for sale by owners uh, or FISBOs are obviously those people who choose to try selling their home without the advantages of having a professional realtor working with them. There are three primary reasons that some home sellers attempt to sell on their own. The first and most obvious reason that's, uh, that they're trying to save the commission. Second reason is that they want control over the transaction. They feel they're out of control, letting an agent handle the details. There is a third possibility as well. They might be trying to hide something per, from prospective buyers and use a professional may prevent that from happening. Those home sellers who try to sell on their own are often a great source of listings because historically, even in an internet market, most of them end up listing with a real estate agent or selling through a real estate agent. Despite this, there are very often, they are very often the most challenging group to attempt to list. If you, for example, were not a successful professional realtor and plan to sell your home, 
you might believe that an agent does nothing other than a bit of advertising in the newspaper or homes magazines that fine puts it on Zillow or realtor.com and they can put it on Zillow themselves these days. And that 5% or 6% commission is a huge chunk of your potential savings. Wouldn't you at least try to sell it on your own first? After all, you have the nicest home in the neighborhood. Everybody does. And you're pretty sure that a, someone out there will buy your home within a few days of advertising, right? Just stick a sign out front. People are going to flood in the door. This is typical of many for sale by owners. They test the waters prior to listing with a realtor because they want to save thousands of dollars. In order to successfully list for sale by owners, you've got to understand their perspective and you must move slowly. Although surveys indicate that between 70 and 90% of for sale by owners eventually list their homes, most of these property owners, even in hot markets, most of these property owners believe they will be able to sell them on their own. And rushing in to tell them about your service and why they'll never sell on your own is a recipe for failure. Instead, you need to find a way to help them that is non-threatening. The reasons they fail, though, while it's true that home sellers are able to sell their homes for top dollar by themselves, some of them, the vast majority end up listing with realtors or settling for a lower than average price for their type of property in their area. And there are several reasons this happens. First, Home sellers who try to sell on their own don't have access to the same number of buyers that realtors do. If you want to sell any product, whether it's a home, a toothbrush, or a DVD, to get the highest price, you need to get it that product and for, <coughs> excuse me, for the most customers. For example, if you create a product like a book and try selling it on your own to consumers, you're probably not going to sell very many. But you wouldn't have to pay for distribu distribution to warehouses. You wouldn't have to pay Barnes & Noble or Amazon to sell it. And therefore, the theory goes, you make four or five times as much on every book if you just cut out the middleman and the retailers. The problem with that type of thinking is most buyers buy books online at Amazon or they go to Barnes & Noble. We're far more likely to sell our product if our product is in the places where people shop. Think about where buyers for your listings come from. Most homes sell through the multiple listing system, which the seller can't utilize without a realtor. And most direct home buyers that come to us first shop on the internet. They go to Realtor.com, Zillow, Central21.com, Homes.com, and so on. Again, sellers without agents can't get their homes listed in many of these places with the exception of Zillow without hiring an agent. And by the way, Zillow then sells every buyer lead information to realtors who then contact the person anyway. They don't actually send the leads typically to the, um, the owner. They also can't get their property in the MLS. Second reason private sellers don't get top dollar is that buyers realize the sellers don't have to pay a commission. And so the buyer automatically expects to pay less for the property. They expect that commission to come off that price. I can't tell you how many, how often a buyer has told me, well, I'm buying this home directly because I'm saving the commission. I'm dropping the price to saving the commission. Those buyers in the marketplace searching through the private sale ads are working a little harder to find the deal than those who simply call a realtor. They realize that FISBO sellers are not paying a commission, so they expect the seller to reduce their price by the price of the commission. And the third reason that FISBOs for sale by owners often sell for less is that many buyers will not purchase a home privately without an agent. So um, it's funny. I, I was uh, When I started talking about for sale by owners at a, an event in Orlando, Florida, I was talking to uh, television personality Susie Ormond, and she said she had spoken with one of the bellhops who said he'd purchased a home in the last two years uh, with directly from the seller. And he said, I would never, ever do it again. Buyers have to arrange for their own financing, pay an attorney to write an offer, find a title or escrow company, find a home inspector, and handle all the details of the transaction themselves. And on top of that, they worry about making a mistake that can cost them thousands of dollars. What if the seller's hiding somebody or something? Who's going to protect them? Even though these are valid reasons that for sale by owners typically sell for less than homes listed with a realtor or end up listing with a realtor despite all their efforts, you will usually fail in your attempt to list the home if your approach to the seller is directly explaining these things. Because people believe what they want to believe. And they believe that you will say anything to get your five or six or 7%. So you have to approach them with a benefit that's honest and will help you to build a relationship with them so that when they do decide they finally need the services of a professional realtor, they're going to come to you. And once you've approached that for sale by owner with a benefit, you need to stay in contact with that seller. Most private sellers only attempt to sell their own home for about three to five weeks. That's not a long period of time. 
you're going to need to contact them at least once a week, preferably twice a week, a week until they're ready to list. You're also going to need a, a reasons to contact them regularly so you don't sound like you're pushy or offensive. So again, you can use the pre-crumpled letters technique. It works just as well for sale by owners as it does with expired listings. Other ones are cold calls, calls to them. So I'm going to start with the relocation one. When someone is selling a home, they are most often moving to another home. They're, they may be selling to relocate out of the area, or they may be selling to move to a bigger or a smaller home in the same town. Certainly, there are people who try selling a property on their own that's a rental property or maybe in a state or a second home, but most for sale by owners are selling their house, their primary residence to move to another primary residence. And these homeowners may try to save the commission by selling on their own, but may be very willing to have an agent work with them to find a home, to find that perfect home. So the goal of this technique is to introduce yourself as someone who can either assist them in purchasing their new home or assist them by referring them to the best agent in another area, and you still get to collect a referral fee. The secondary goal in listing the home is, is listing the home at a later date if the home doesn't sell for sale by owner. If you become their agent in the buying end, you're far more likely to be a person that they use to sell the home. So whenever I speak with a for sale by owner, I'm always beginning by telling them I'm not calling to try to get them to list their home. As soon as you say your company name, they're gonna be wary. You need to put them at ease as quickly as possible. Next, follow up an explanation of how you help people to find the perfect home. Sometimes that home's local and sometimes that home's across the country. So here's a dialogue. Hi, is this the owner of the property listed uh, on Zillow? Yes. Well, before I say anything else, I just wanna let you know that I am a realtor, but I'm not calling to try and list your house. My name is Hermione Granger and I'm with Century 21 Kime Realtors here in the Poconos. Again, I'm not calling to try and list your house. What I do is try to help people find the perfect property, whether they stay local or whether they move out of state. Since you're selling your home, I'm wondering, where are you planning on moving to? Oh, I'm planning to buy a larger home in the area. I'd like to buy new construction. Well, that's great. Do you have an agent working with you to assist you in your purchase? No, but I thought I'd go directly to the builders in the area so I get a better deal. You know, it's funny. A lot of buyers think that. The truth is that builders in the area generally charge you exactly the same amount, whether you bring in an agent or not. In fact, if the builder's using a real estate firm to market their properties, that agent represents the best interest of the builders, not yours. And bringing in a buyer's agent to rep represent you not only costs you absolutely nothing, but may help you to negotiate a better deal. I didn't know that. Most people don't. I'd love to stop by and spend a few minutes with you discussing how I can help you in finding the perfect new construction home and get the best possible deal for you. Would it be possible for me to stop by an evening this week or would, would it be better if I stopped by on a weekend? You may find the sellers planning to moving out of the area or across the country. Now you may be able to get a referral fee. And again, it gives you a reason to stay in contact. If you can get them to talk to you, then you can refer them to somebody. You can then call back and say, how did that agent do? Were they able to find you something? So you have a reason to contact them. So what I do is uh, try to help people find the perfect property, whether they stay local or move out of state. Since you're selling your home, I was wondering where you're moving to. Well, I'm taking a job transfer to St. Charles, Missouri, and I'm not sure you can help me. Well, it's a beautiful area right near St. Louis, right? Yes, it is. Do you have an agent you're working with in St. Charles currently? Uh, not yet. I've been looking at listings on Zillow, but I didn't think I'd get serious until I have some offers on my home. Well, that's a good idea. I'm actually part of one of the country's largest relocation networks. I can research the market in St. Charles and try and find you the best one or two agents that can handle your move. I, I would make sure that no one pressures you, but also make sure that you they send you good information to help you find the right home in the perfect location. You know, too many home buyers could uh, pick an agent off the internet and get stuck with somebody who doesn't have their best interests at heart. Would you, mind, would you mind if I did a little research using our relocation network to find you a dynamite agent who would work in your best interest? Well, I guess. Great. Let me ask you a few questions just to understand what you're looking for in Missouri. What type of home would be perfect for you? And by the way, you can also refer somebody to more than one realtor. You can refer them to two in an area and have both of them call them. And whichever one they pick, you end up getting a referral fee from. An alternative, the downside of this approach is that sometimes a for sale by owner has already found a home or they're not planning to purchase again. This approach makes it difficult for you to recover and ask to see the home because you've already told them your purpose is to assist them in finding one. So one method of recovering is to mention that you're working with many other buyers as well. Well, before I say anything else, I want to let you know that I am a realtor, but I'm not calling to try and list your home. My name is Alex Ross, and I'm with Central 21 Kime Realtors here in Quakertown. 
Again, I'm not calling to try and list your home. What I do is try to help people find the perfect property, whether they stay in local or move out of state. Since you're selling your home, I was wondering, where are you moving to? Well, I'm staying in the area, but I've already purchased another home. I'm just waiting to settle on that until this one sells. Well, that's great. Where is your new home? It's in uh, on Overlook in the Stones Throw neighborhood. Well, that's a great area. Would you be obligated to purchase uh, even if your current home doesn't sell? Oh, I don't think that'll be a problem. My home is absolutely beautiful. It's priced right and it'll sell probably in a few days. Well, it sounded nice in the ad. But let me ask you another question. I'm working with a lot of other buyers at the moment. If I had a buyer that was looking for a home like yours, would you let me show it? Well, I don't want to pay a commission. That's why I'm selling it myself. I understand that. And I try and build the commission into the purchase price. But if I had a buyer, would you let me show it? Well, how would you build it in? Well, I'd probably increase the price or I'd try and build it into what the buyer paid or I'd figure something out. I've done that many times. Well, I guess it couldn't hurt. That sounds great. Would you mind if I stopped over and took a quick walk through so I know what I'm looking at, uh, what it looks like, and I can describe it to many of the buyers I'm working with? Now, keep in mind, anytime you're speaking with a for sale by owner on the phone, your goal is, again, to meet face to face. The first agent who meets that prospective client person is almost always the person to list the property if the seller needs assistance. And after a few weeks of working with for sale by owners, you'll also find that you'll have more success in getting in the door if you're one of the very first agents to call them. Once you've made it in the door with any for sale by owner approaches, you'll need to lay out a strong follow-up program so you can stay in touch with them over the typical three to five weeks they attempt to sell on their own. And keep in mind that during this time frame. They'll continue to receive phone calls from other agents. You don't want to be as displaced in the owner's mind by somebody else. So working with the owner as a buyer is a strong approach because it gives you the benefit of immediately sending listings, then calling within a few days to see if any of the listings uh, were ones they wanted to view. You can continue sending listings and following up the phone calls without, worrying, uh, without the worry of asking them to list with you. And during this period, you may also ask how the sale of their home is going. And if they like you as a buyer's agent, they'll likely open up about their challenges. And if the seller's moving out of the area, you can create several contacts by sending the client a thank you note, then contacting the agent or two in the area where they're moving. Call the agent and let them know that you found one or two, or call the seller and let them know that you found one or two great agents that you've given them their information. And follow up with the seller two or three days later to make sure they heard from those agents. And again, maintain that consistent contact. I have a buyer campaign similar to the approaches to expired listings. You can call with a purpose of explaining that you're a successful agent working with several buyers that are looking in the area. You simply want to determine if this particular owner would consider paying a partial commission if you brought them a buyer. And most of them will. Uh, you want to assure the owner, though, that you're not trying to list the home at this point because you don't want them to shut down and ignore everything else you say. So here's a sample dialogue. Hi, is this the owner of the property listed on fizbo.com? Uh, yes, it is. Well, before I say anything else, I want to let you know that I am a realtor, but I'm not calling to try and list your home. My name is Maggie, and I'm here with Century 21 Kime Realtors and Undertakers in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Again, I'm not calling to try and list your house. However, I do work in the neighborhood, and I have a number of buyers looking for homes right now. I was wondering if you would pay a commission if I brought a buyer for your home. Do you have a buyer for your home for my home? I don't know. I haven't seen your home yet. But I'm working with a lot of buyers that are looking in the area. I'm hoping one of them will like your house. From the ad on Zillow, it looks like a great property, and I do have some serious buyers. Would you be willing to pay a fee if I brought you a buyer? Well, what kind of fee are you talking about? Well, that can be negotiable, and I'll try and build my fee into the price. But typically, I'm paid half the commission on normal sale if another agent had the listings. And commissions uh, range from 5 to 6%, so usually I'd be bringing a buyer in for 25 or 3%. Would that be acceptable? I guess that doesn't sound too bad. Great. I'd like to stop out if possible and take a quick walk through the home so I can uh, describe it to my buyers, what day works best for you. I'm free Thursday evening, Friday morning, and again on Saturday morning. What would work best for you? I would, of course, say that much slower than I just did on this uh, recording since I'm running really long today. Another uh, approach is the mortgage co-conspirator. Uh, another method for approaching for sale by owners is to work with a mortgage or originator or mortgage officer who can contact the owner because the owner may need financing for their new home. And certainly the buyers of their home will need financing. If and when the owner begins leaning toward the need for a realtor, that mortgage originator can provide a third party endorsement of you as the best agent they can possibly use. Now, this approach requires you to enlist the age of a mortgage officer who doesn't mind making phone calls. If you're already giving mortgage business to a particular person, you might suggest that they're likely to get mortgage leads out of this 
and that you'll happily guarantee all future business you possibly can to this mortgage person. And that mortgage originator may even walk through the home to give the owner some advice and then suggest they get a market analysis and some staging advice from an expert. Hey, you know, I know this great agent, Carolyn, from Central 21 Kime, and I'm sure she would uh, do a market analysis at no charge, and she wouldn't pressure you to list. Should I give her a call? Sample dialogue for the mortgage broker is, hi, is this the owner of the property listed in today's paper? Yes, it is. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm with Bank of Your Town. I am not a realtor, so don't worry. I'm just calling because I saw your ad and I was wondering, when you have buyers looking at your home, do you have a good mortgage broker who can help qualify them to purchase your home? Uh, no, but they, they probably have somebody they're working with. Well, most people don't. It's so critical to make sure buyers qualify before taking your home off the market and then having it fall through five or six months later or five or six weeks later. What I can do for you is this. I can prepare a closing cost estimate on your home for potential buyers. You know, I'll even do a flyer in your home that lays out several different mortgage programs and how much your home would be monthly for the buyers. These flyers really help buyers to make up their mind. All I'd want in return is for you to refer them to me if they need a good mortgage company. Does it sound like a fair trade? It's a really good approach. It's hard to get somebody to do that. Yes, it does. Great. What I normally do is stop by for a few minutes, get some information, and then maybe borrow for a few photos from you for the brochure. Then I can get it together in a day or so. Are you free during the day or would the evening work better? And the mortgage broker can then lead into financing for the seller to purchase their new home as well. And this approach is very powerful because the mortgage broker's uh, contact the owner is not viewed with the same fear as realtors contacting them. And that mortgage broker can give an all-important third-party endorsement to the agent. One of the classic methods of approaching for sale by owners is the for sale by owner um, survival pack, giving them something of value, putting together a binder with much of the information the owner needs to sell their home, including a sales contract, buyer qualification form, and maybe a copy of uh, Lauren's book, How to Sell Your Home in a Market, available in stores everywhere. The difficulty I always encounter when teaching this technique is that agents believe they can simply mail the package to a for sale by owner or mail a letter suggesting they can get a copy without ever calling the property owner. And in our test, we found that agents are nine times more likely to list for sale by owner if they meet that owner face to face. You will not meet them face to face by mailing stuff to them. You need to call and then follow up with them and then meet with them and then send a thank you note for meeting with them. A sample dialogue might be, hi, is this the owner of the property listed in the newspaper? Yes. Well, before I say anything, I want to let you know that I'm a realtor, but I'm not calling to list your home. My name is William Talltree, and I'm here with Central 21 Kime Realtors and Lumberjack Realty in the Lake Wall and Paul Pack area. What I'd like to offer you is a fair trade. I'd like to drop off a full package of all the information and forms you might need to sell your home, including a blank agreement of sale, blank sales contract, information on how a buyer might finance your home, and 20 more legal documents you may need to put uh, sale together. I'll also include some tips and techniques on how to stage a home. There's no charge or obligation. And there's two reasons I do this with home sellers who are selling on their own. First, at some point, you may decide you want to hire an agent. And if you do, I'd like the opportunity to become one of those few people that you interview. And second, if you are able to sell your home on your own, I'm hoping that you'll be so impressed with the information that I give you that you're going to refer me any of your family or friends who don't have the... Um, a wherewithal to go out and try selling on their own. Does that sound like a fair trade? Yes, that is a mouthful, but it's also a strong approach to get in the door and meet them. They may respond that they plan on using an attorney. That's okay. It helps to understand uh, what's going to happen with inspections, contingencies, and conditions that are typical to put in any um, agreement between a buyer and seller. Now, a FISBO survival pack is going to have a lot of stuff in it. A blank sales contract, property disclosure form, financial statement for the buyers, a booklet that outlines a sales process, an open house sheet, a list of whole, a local home inspectors, 20 questions asked an agent before listing, all sorts of things that are guaranteed by the time they get through all of them to scare them a little bit because there's so much to selling a house. But it is something that really gets them gets in the door and gets them thinking about you as their agent. And then there's also the honest approach. Truth is that many of you would rather take a simple and direct approach, and that's great. When you're taking a simple direct approach, please keep in mind that many for sale by owners will tell you they don't want to hear from you ever again. Your best method of meeting them might be a stealth tactic like the relocation approach or mortgage co-conspirator approach. But a simple approach is to explain that you specialize in homes in the area. You like to introduce yourself and maybe they'll sell their home on their own and maybe they won't. But in either case, you'd like to be a source of information and experience for them if they have any questions. If they decide to hire a real estate professional, 
you'd like the opportunity to interview. Uh, the uh, dialogue might be, hi, is this the owner of the property listed for sale in the newspaper or on Zillow? Yes. Before I say anything else, I want to let you know that I am a realtor. My name is Bruce Wayne. I'm with Century 21, Sign of the Bat Real Estate here in Gotham. I truly respect your desire to sell your home on your own, and I promise not to bother you. But I specialize in homes in the area, and I just want to make sure it's okay for me to drop off some information on myself and my team. I don't need an agent. I'm not paying the commission. I plan on selling it on my own. That's no problem. I always feel that if I introduce myself to many of the individuals trying to sell on their own, some of them may find over time that if they do want to move more quickly, they may end up using a realtor. Your circumstances may change. You may interview agents. I just want to be included if you decide to interview. So would you mind if I dropped off some literature about my team? It's another approach. Now we've gone through for sale by owners, expired listings, cold calling, and sphere of influence. And for those of you who have, uh, that are watching this today that have been doing real estate for a while, you've probably seen this quote before, but insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If you are not earning what you need to and not living up to your expectations, then you need to change your habits. The most important thing you can do is to increase your income, is to start building, to increase your income, is to build a book of business by selecting a target audience or two and begin prospecting campaigns. So many realtors think they have to start over, whether they leave a company or they leave their career because things aren't going the way they want. Anybody can make a great living in real estate. Anybody can. It depends on what you're willing to put into it. So if things aren't going the way you want, figure out how to make it work. And the part of that is going to be starting to prospect. When you want to grow your income, the only ways you can grow your income are to generate more leads, to convert a better percentage of those leads, to build stronger follow-up systems, and in the long run to deliver exceptional service. But it all starts with generating leads. Generating leads, you can either pay for them by paying Zillow gazillions of dollars or paying referral fees to OpCity or paying for online leads or marketing. Or you can pick up the phone and start calling people to generate leads. Either way works. But that's the most important key in starting to build your business for the future. And another, another couple of reminders before I let you go today. Not everyone in your social circles and your sphere of influence knows what you do. Just remember, you don't remember what every one of your friends from high school and college and people that are past coworkers and your nieces and nephews and second cousins, you don't know what all of them are doing for a living right now. So you have to remind them and you have to ask them for help on a regular basis. And by the way, take some time and share some listings on your social network pages, even if they're not your listings. Share them from your personal MoxieWorks website so people come back to you. And if you don't have that set up yet, then share them from Central21.com. Please don't share them from Zillow. And so last thing I'll say is some assignments. Keep adding people to your contact management uh, network, to your MoxieWorks list. Prepare and send out your initial letter, your sphere of influence, or your social network. Get that done this week. Take some time. Prepare at least two posts on social media about your real estate career and share listings from your personal website or from ours. Set up a business page on Facebook or Instagram. Call some expired listings or some for sale by owners and get used to that. And I also suggest taking two courses at Central 21 University offers. One is called Lead Gen 21, Expired Listings 90-Minute Workshop. And the second is social media strategies. I think these are great uh, things that'll help you increase what you're going to be able to do in your career. So that's all I've got for this week. I know this was a lot of stuff this week. Next week, we're going to take prospecting to the next level. Have a great week.